both a bowler and a batsman, my guest today is a cricket all-rounder. But he's also a voracious reader and one of those rare people who's not shy to admit that he's deeply religious. Here to tell us more about himself is the unconventional and amazing Sanjay Bangar. Welcome to the program, Sanjay. Thank you very much, sir. Let's start with yourself. They say that it's people like you that have really made Indian cricket a people's game. Would you accept that? I, I would say so because uh, earlier used to be, you know, people or uh, players from a particular region uh, coming and playing for for the country uh, on an average, you know, at, at there were times when out of the 11 players, 9 players used to be from Bombay or uh, the some players from the North Zone used to be, you know, uh, they would be comprising part now of the Now it's become more team. national. It's become more national because uh, uh, players from all parts of uh, the country, even from the smaller cities, they've managed and they've graduated to uh, and gone on to play for the country. But I think in your case, the real fascination is perhaps with your background. Your father says that his parents were in fact agricultural wage laborers. Yeah, they were and uh, I, I remember that, you know, uh, uh, my father telling me that they used to work in those mills at, at times or uh, in Bombay also and uh, when they were at in the villages, they used to work as uh, agricultural laborers. In fact, the family saw the hardest of times. Your father, I believe, actually left home because his parents didn't have enough money to bring him up. Yeah, that's true and uh, in fact my father had uh, to undergo a lot of hardships uh, to, to uh, attain education at uh, high school level, not only at high school level, even at the pre-high school levels and... Uh, uh, but right, he even had at one point in time had to earn money washing clothes and doing the daily chores of his teachers. It so happened that uh, he was supposed to be studying at a place uh, which was a bit far away from our village and uh, he had to live there. So, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, head, headmaster of the school uh, saw that there was some spark in this young guy and he said that you need not do up and down every day and you can live, you can live here and tr I'll try to see to it that, you know, uh, some of the some of the core teachers would help help him with the food uh, on a daily basis. So uh, each day he had to go at a particular teacher's place, do whatever work was given to him by by that teacher on that day. And uh, the teacher instead, you know, uh, he would uh, give him some food for that day, and it was divided on a weekly basis. So that was how he underwent uh, education in the school days. Even in 1972, when you were born, things were still pretty tight for the family. I gather the first home that you were born into was in fact just a single room. Yeah, it's true. And uh, it was in a place called Mazilgao in Maharashtra. And uh, uh, he was uh, working with the state government. And uh, uh, we five of us uh, used to live in a single room. So if your grandparents could see today how far you've come, I imagine they would be understandably very proud. You know, whenever uh, I went to my village uh, during the summer vacations in my school days, uh, at that from that time onwards, I had this great fascination for cricket. I was in, totally into love with it, and uh, they used to ask me what I'm going to become, and I was always used to say that one day I'll become a cricket player and play for India. And they said, "What's this all cricket player ab all about?" They couldn't you know, understand. They it. they couldn't understand and. Uh, they, they, they used to tell me that, you know, it's better off, you know, you become a collector like your father or you become, you become a doctor or an engineer because becoming a cricketer or playing for India made no sense to them at that time. Quite right. They didn't see it as a means of advancement. They wanted you to materially improve your life, not go in for sport. Yeah, probably their, their, uh, broad, their, their horizon or their mind set up didn't really accept those things at that time. Your father says that you were perhaps six, maybe seven, when your fascination with cricket began. And he says it started listening to the commentary on radio sitting beside him. Yeah, and I remember that uh, those were the test matches uh, that were happening in West Indies at that time. And uh, it was probably late in the midnight that uh, the test matches we used to get to hear in India. And uh, here, were my, here was my dad uh, as he was going to bed along with the radio. Uh, listening to commentary and uh, me, be, me, besides him. So 
that uh, really developed uh, a keen interest in me. Now, when your father discovered, or maybe realized, that you had the potential to become a great cricketer, he actually made quite an amazing sacrifice to secure a cricket career for you, didn't he? Yeah, that was at the age of 15. And uh, uh, I had just played for Maharashtra under 15 at that time in, uh, in the year 1988. And uh, the, uh, the coach, my, my coach at that time in Aurangabad, Mr. Kiran Joshi, uh, he told uh, my dad that, you know, uh, he, he had some talent, that I had some talent in me. And take him to Bombay. And he said that it would be better if, uh, if I was taken to Bombay and exposed to that infrastructure, to that cricket, uh, cricket structure. And uh, I could become a bet better cricketer exposed to all those competitions there. And to do that, your father sent the family with your mother to Bombay whilst he lived away to carry on working and earning money for years at a time. Uh, that was actually before that. Uh, 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 we spent uh, nearly 10 years in Aurangabad. And uh, he, my dad used to get transport every three years. Uh, so uh, just because our education wasn't suffered, uh, was not to suffer, he, he used to uh, go and live on his own and uh, uh, at that uh, place where he was posted. So, and uh, now I know that, you know, how, how difficult it is for a couple to stay uh, away from each other for such a long time and over such a long period. You lived with your mother in Bombay for that long length of period. She herself also took a very personal interest in your cricket, didn't she? Yeah. In fact, she was uh, really the force uh, uh, which guided me uh, throughout those years because my dad is not very expressive, is not very uh, outcoming in the sense that he doesn't uh, come and uh, say uh, certain things probably. Uh, but my mother was quite uh, uh, outgoing, you know. She used to come, she used to pat, and she used to show, express her love and express her concern. Uh, so it was, in fact, her dream, wasn't it, that one day you should play for India? Yeah, it was everybody's dream. It's not only her dream. It was the dream of my parents, dream of my brother, my sister, everybody around In a way, me. in a real sense, you were the hope of the family. They were all going to live their dreams through you. Uh, yeah. Actually, you can say that because... But did that make the pressure intense? No, it didn't actually. But uh, I, I realized, you know, the, the importance of the sacrifices being made for my sake. Uh, in fact, my brother also, uh, he was very, he's very good at sports. He's, go, he's got a great temperament sports-wise. But uh, the decision had to be made once, you know, when uh, just uh, after we had come to Bombay, uh, and I had acquired, I think, 82% marks uh, in the 10th standard. And then there was this debate going on in our family whether I should take up science or commerce because science would then require more time for studies for those practicals. And how did the debate decide itself? Uh, my coach uh, at the Shivaji Park Jimkhana, Mr. Deepak Murkar, uh, I mean, stressed the importance of me taking commerce in order to pursue cricket in a more larger way. So he told my parents that I should be okay with commerce. And cricket, of course, became the focus of your life and your parents' concern in another way as well. When you were 14 or 15 and you began to tour around to play, your parents made you take a rather unique vow, didn't they? Yeah, they did. And they, uh, as, as is the concern with all the parents, they were uh, concerned whether I would fall into bad habits or fall into bad company. And they asked me to, they asked me to take a vow that, you know, I wouldn't drink alcohol or uh, smoke at any point in my life. And, and have you lived up to that vow ever since? Yes, so far I have lived up to it and I'm quite not confident. Not a drink, not a cigarette at all? Never. Sadly, in March 2000, your mother died of cancer. Yeah. It must have been a traumatic time for you. Uh, it, not only at that time, but uh, ever since we got to know, ever since the disease was detected, uh, we knew that she had limited time on hand and uh, the, the, the doctors told us that uh, it would be one and a half years maximum that she would live and there was no cure for that, no treatment for that. So uh, I think uh, we lost her for those 500 days, each, each day. In each day you saw her slowly dying? Yeah, I saw, saw her, you know, degenerating sort of a thing because uh, the, the, the worst look that I got of her was that uh, 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 after the disease was detected, 
I had to go and play in a Devdar Trophy match, and uh, it was for around I think 20 days I was away from Bombay, and in the meanwhile she had to go two two cycles of chemotherapy, and uh, and because of that all her hairs were lost and she became very weak and you know, and as as I rang the door once I came back, uh, the look that I got from her she came and she she was just there for two minutes, and I saw her and she she dropped her eyes and I dropped my eyes because uh, she didn't really want to come uh, in front of me uh, in that state really. Of the sad that part is I suppose that look probably haunts you forever. Yeah, it does. You just can't wipe it out? No, I can't. Your mother's dream, like the family's dream, was that you should play. It happened 19 months roughly after she died. Had she seen you, she would have been very, very proud. Yeah, and I am quite uh, sure that she's she's happy and she's very proud even now. And I I really feel her presence even now. And I don't feel that she's like an angel watching over you. Uh, yeah, and she does have a bit of a persuasion for me because uh, I think without her blessings I wouldn't have played uh, for India and uh, 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 done those uh, things that I did. Of course, there is another one of her dreams that you were able to fulfil before she died. She wanted to see you married. And she made sure that you did get married, didn't she? Yeah, she made sure. And as is the case with uh, probably a lot of Indian h households where the, the parents want their child to get married as soon as they can at every <laughs> given instance. But uh, at that time when, uh, when we came to know of the disease and she, she thought that, you know, uh, I should get married and probably the time was right for me. But uh, I thought that, you know, I could probably maybe get married after one or two years because I wasn't anywhere in cricket at that time and uh, I also had to do the job also I was also studying at that time and I thought and those impending disease of hers so I was not in a proper frame of mind but one night she told me that you know what guys what you guys have done for me what what uh, how do you care for my happiness if you really care for me uh, you please marry and you said yes. And uh, then, and this was an emotional sort of a blackmail <laughs> at that time. And uh, I told that, uh, just give me some time. And uh, uh, then I consulted uh, my uh, friend or spiritual guide, you could Dr. say. Dr. Ketkar. Dr. Ketkar. And he said yes. And after that, even before I saw Kashmir, I had made up my mind that I would marry her. She was, in fact, the person your mother wanted you to marry. Yes, yeah, she was the person. And yet the amazing thing is, you had only known Kashmira for 20 days when you married her. Weren't you apprehensive? Uh, no, I had, uh, I wasn't apprehensive, but uh, I wanted, you know, my mother to be happy at that time. And uh, I just thought, you know, I could do this bit for her in her last days. That would be enough. Let's take a break there, Sanjay. I want to come back in part two and talk about the Sanjay Bangar the world thinks they know, not the private person but the cricketer. We'll be back in a moment's time. Don't go away. Welcome back to Face to Face. My guest is Sanjay Bangar. Sanjay, let's talk about cricket. You often say that the turning point in your life came, in, as far as cricket is concerned, when you were 13 and you joined the Pioneer Cricket Club in Aurangabad. And yet, I gather when you went for your selection, you didn't have a proper bat, you didn't even have gloves. And no, I didn't have the pads as well, so <laughs> I had to undergo that selection trial. It was on a very un sort of uh, it was not a very flat track, you can say, and uh, it was with a cock ball, which is quite hard. Uh, so uh, and there I was because the camp was going to be uh, uh, taken by Mr. Vasant Amladi, and he was the former uh, coach of uh, Sunil Gavaskar and. I really wanted badly to, 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 to train under him. So I gave the trial with a broken bat and without, uh, uh, without the leg guards. But I managed to impress uh, the selectors at that time. With your sheer willpower and determination. Yeah, and uh, if I remember correctly, I batted quite well in that uh, uh, selection trial. Now, as you mentioned, one of the books that you were given as a present when you were 15 also had a huge influence on you, Sunil Gavaskar's Sunny Days. 
Yeah, it was. And uh, when I was uh, in Pune for uh, and undergoing a, a coaching camp for Maharashtra under 15 team, my father came and visited me, and he presented me uh, with a copy of this book. And uh, it was through this book that you know I I could visualize how a life of an international cricketer can be, how I mean what sacrifices a Test cricketer has to make uh, for his team for his own sake and the traveling that he has to undergo, the, the personal sacrifices. You read the book, what was it, 15, 20 times? I've read that book uh, uh, many times over. So you almost not bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably till maybe five years ago, I would probably ca could tell anything about that book. Does this explain why when you eventually made your debut for India in December 2001 in Mohali, you started by touching Sunil Gavaskar's feet? Yeah, subconsciously, and it wasn't an effort made, you know, consciously that uh, uh, I knew that, you know, I was going to play that match at Chandigarh, and it wasn't planned. So, uh, on the morning of the match, I was just uh, uh, hitting a few balls to get my eye in before the start of the match, and uh, suddenly I looked there at the clubhouse, and I saw Mr. Gavaskar standing there in the media box. So. And it just occurred to me that I should go and, you know, touch his feet because... It was an instinctive thing. It was an instinctive thing and probably the, the, the book that my father presented and through that book uh, which I saw, um, I, I saw what test cricket was all about and I thought... Uh, probably and you'd made him a guru almost. Probably, yes. It was not the first test, although you did extremely well, but your second in Nagpur against Zimbabwe that really established you as a national batsman. That century, did it take you completely by surprise? Uh, I wasn't expecting to score a hundred at that, uh, at that in that innings because uh, uh, we were told by the team management. I mean, I think uh, uh, it was on the third day that uh, we batted. Uh, I batted for nearly two hours and scored 21 runs. And uh, Sachin was at the other end. He was past his hundred. So. Uh, the team management told that uh, there were plans for declaration and we should get fast runs. And here I was playing in my second test innings. And uh, I just thought that, you know, there was this fear of losing my place at that time uh, if I went for my shots and got out early. But I just thought that to help with that and I went with my shots. And This is one of those moments when your mother was with you, willing you along. Yeah. And I, I think where, uh, wherever, whichever level of cricket I play, uh, I, I feel her presence and I feel that she's backing me all the time. There was another great innings just four months later in August 2002 at Headingley when you and Dravid steadied the Indian team and it ended up with Dravid giving you a rather unusual nickname. Uh, yeah, and uh, I don't know why he called me and uh, nicknamed me the Buddha because what happened is that uh, the conditions were tough at that day and uh, we were already one down in the series. Let me answer your question. He says he called you the Buddha because you were frighteningly unemotional and completely in control. Uh, well, that's all. I mean, uh, you are always in that state when you get into the groove, when you're probably your concentration is at the peak. And I, I have this habit of not talking when I'm in the middle, when I'm batting with the non-striker or But can you contain your tension and your emotion so perfectly that even Dravid on the other side can't detect it? Uh, I don't know, but I don't really speak a lot uh, in the middle and it was that sort of a day, day that, you know, that uh, commitment was required and uh, I'm glad that uh, I could uh, set up the base for one of uh, India's uh, uh, biggest overseas win on a foreign soil. Now, as a bowler, your fans often say that perhaps your greatest performance was this January in Adelaide. Zimbabwe needed seven runs off the last over when you were given that critical last over to bowl. Were you nervous or were you challenged? Uh, none of the two because I just thought that here was a job to be done. and uh, I So you were Buddha-like again? <laughs> And that was probably, again, the, I think Rahul came and, you know, hugged me and said that, okay, Buddha, you've done it again, and <laughs> that sort of thing. But, but before he hugged you and said, okay, Buddha, you had two dot balls, a wicket, and eventually you came down to a position where Zimbabwe needed six of the last ball. At that point, were you completely contained and calm and cool, or was there a little bang, bang, bang inside you? Uh, no, I think the Chetan Sharma... Uh, memory came back to me and uh, I think uh, it wasn't uh, India has lost uh, uh, such type of uh, matches on a lot of occasions and uh, I had to you know 
put the ball in the right place and thankfully I did. <laughs> now they say off the field, you are a voracious reader, but is it true that you like war history? Uh, yeah, I like to read uh, uh, Indian war history actually, what happened uh, to our past, you know, uh, great leaders or great individuals who... What is it? Is it the strategizing that intrigues you and interests you? No, it's not the strat strategizing. It's basically related to that individual character, uh, which I'm quite uh, keenly into it. You like heroes? Yeah, I do like heroes. You identify with them? Uh, I don't know. Your father says that increasingly now when you're traveling abroad and you find Bibles in hotel rooms, you've begun reading the Bible as well. Uh, well, uh, ever since I've uh, uh, joined the Indian team, uh, there's this rule of, you know, uh, you get uh, a room on your own. It's not on a sharing basis. So what happens is that uh, once you can't watch television all the time, you can't practice, you can't, you know, go to the gym all the time. So there are moments of despair or there are moments of happiness and you're quiet by yourself at that time. So uh, uh, in that time, probably I try and find solace in uh, these uh, uh, books. Your wife says that sometimes when you're in a blue mood or you're a little dispirited, you even write notes to God. Yeah, I do, no I do write notes to God. And basically, it's just that uh, it's not, uh, not only when things are not going well for me, uh, even when things are going well for me, I just feel that, you know, uh, there are there are certain things wh which you can't share with anybody, which you have to keep to yourself. And uh, uh, at those times, I feel that you know I, uh, I should write something to that uh, superpower. And you I do made that. God almost like a personal friend. Yeah, he's my personal friend. And it doesn't embarrass you to talk about him or to talk or to admit that you're religious, because many other people feel embarrassed by this. No, I don't, because I believe that there's some force which is guiding us and. Uh, uh, and uh, I accept that. You believe in destiny? Yeah, totally. So there is a force constantly moving you along, regardless of whether you're playing in the team or not? Yeah, it is, because uh, uh, I, I believe that uh, if, if, if there are certain things which are destined and which have been written uh, in my uh, plans made by the, the Almighty, I, I'm sure that nobody can take that away from me. And you also believe that whatever the Almighty does, He will always do for the best. Yeah, He does it for the best. Even now, wherever I am and whatever stage of my career, I think that it's His wish and I believe it. I believe and I totally accept that. Sanjeev Bangar, a pleasure having you on the program. Wonderful. Thank you.